Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Words of Life podcast and uh, video blog vlog. Uh, I am Adam. This is Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Hey, Adam. How you doing? I am great. How's your week been? Uh, so far, so good. It's been good. Um, Maddie just finished up. Our daughter uh, finished yeah. up her associate's degree. She was dual enrolled in college and high school. So her graduation from high school is in like two weeks, mm -hmm. but she finished up her last class last week. So she is done with her associate's degree. So Which uh, is pretty yeah, amazing. It is. It's quite an accomplishment by her. It took her three years doing it, you know, dual enrolled through high school. Right. Um, but so we had graduation parties uh, this past weekend here, this uh, Saturday, Sunday. Right. Um, Graduating high school with your associate's degree is yeah. like... That's, that's that's really great. Yeah, it's pretty good. It uh, yep. should work out nice for her on the uh, cost wise for sure <laughs> for uh, college. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, uh, and but she, didn't she get a, a scholarship for volleyball? The, yeah, some. some. Yeah, certainly yeah. there's some, but it's not like you know she's going yeah. to play D one at some big school where she's getting a full ride of some sort, right? Like that's right, a, right. sort of a myth in in general. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it'll help her a little bit. And you know what she yeah. wants to do? She's probably still got four years because she's probably get her master's in order to do what she wants to do in like physical therapy and stuff like that. So yeah, um, yeah, it'll be so good. Still going to cut down years, yeah. years yeah. total, of and yeah. yeah cost then so, money that you would be paying for your undergrad yeah. type stuff you can now apply towards your master's degree or whatever yeah well, we're very proud of her for sure yeah. uh what's funny is megan megan brought her graduation card that, we're, that i have to mail tomorrow by the way yeah um and she said here fill, sign this i'm like can i just add my name to yours you already wrote or something right and i didn't i didn't bother to read what megan wrote sure, yeah i'm like, fine she's making me write something so i i wrote down oh we're so proud of you and all this kind of stuff and and uh, Megan looks at it. She's like, "You wrote the exact same thing I did." Like the exact. <laughs> I wrote the word. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even look. That's okay. She did get a card from somebody, a graduation card, and uh -huh. um, there's several different kids in this family, right? That she yeah. goes to school with. One's a senior, and so he's graduating with her. Another one's a junior, I think, and plays on the volleyball team. And then there's a younger one who's maybe like a freshman. And there's even younger ones than that. But uh, and he played right. on the basketball team, so he knows a little bit. But uh, he, we got this graduation card. And she opens it up, and it's got all these people in there, all the family, the mom and the dad, and the different siblings, children that have signed things. And one of them says, happy birthday, Maddie, Toby. <laughs> and so we're trying to figure out, like, is he being funny? Because that would be the kind of thing he'd do. Or did he just get a card from his mom? Say, like, here, sign this for Maddie. And he didn't read it. He's like, happy birthday, right? <laughs> Assume it was a birthday card. <laughs> right. We're not sure what it was. Either but... one's plausible, right? Yeah, that's Either right. Yeah, plausible. yeah. So like, I'll have to tell her to ask and find out. Uh, <laughs> is that on purpose? Or did you not realize that uh, yep. you just got handed the card from mom? And you're like, there you go. Yep, done. Right. Yeah. Funny, funny. All right. So just as a recap, everybody, um, we've been studying through the book of First John, and um, we have been taking a, a different angle on the study of the verse of First John because of the last verse of the letter of, or the book in that John writes, uh, my little children, stay away from idols, basically. And so it's kind of a, an, an eyebrow raising. Wow, why does he end the book like Usual that? Usual ending. Yes. Right. And so then we recall that he also kind of had the same flair in the in the Gospel of John and that he put the purpose of the book at the end. So if that is the purpose of the book, let's read the book, uh, the letter, and and try to figure out if he's talking about this theme the, the entire time. And uh, and we have we, we've really uh, thanks to Kevin, really it, uh, un unpacking this a little bit more. Uh, we've been able to to see that. And so. So far, we've talked about, um, and you know, we've Kevin has cleverly <laughs> named these. I, don't know, I can take no there. credit whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, in, in the first chapter, verses uh, five through ten, uh, it really just talks about a God like us. Like, if we make God to be more like man, uh, is is a little bit what he's talking about there. Uh, chapter two, verses one through six, we have a, a disinterested God, as if God does not care, uh, and then. Similarly, uh, verses 7 through 10 of chapter 2, an unloving God. And then last week, we dove into uh, quite a bit into this idea of a God of the world. And uh, there's a lot there. And then the idea of the Antichrist, uh, not the Antichrist, but the idea of people that are 
against Christ. Against Christ. <laughs> yep. Simply put. Yep. Um, and uh, then we have this section uh, in chapter two, verses twenty-eight through chapter three, verses uh, verse ten, which we're going to get in tonight. Uh, which Kevin has titled The Father of Wicked Children. Um, and then, of course, after that, it'll be an, an Unloving God Part 2, kind yeah, of another... Yeah, around and expand on some of those ex- other topics. Yeah, yeah. E- exactly, exactly. So, um, s- oops, wrong one. There we go. So last week, we discussed uh, the Antichrist and spent a lot of time talking about a God of the world. Uh, and it, it's really one warning that we feel is really pertinent for today. Uh, especially living in modern day America, where wealth is an easy thing to fall into the trap of. Do you yeah, want to expand on that, Kevin? For sure, right? I mean, there's this idea uh, that he talks about there, right? I mean, familiar verses to a lot of us. If if you had to cite one thing from First John that people might remember, right? right. Uh, it's probably in that chapter two section there, where he says, "Do not love the world, the things in it, for the love of the world, right? The the desire pride of the flesh, the prize, pride of life, uh, yeah. is not from the Father, but it's from the world, um, and those things are passing away, right? But uh, it, that statement of whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, then, right? And so yeah. uh, we can really easily get wrapped up in the desire the flesh right the desires of eyes, uh the eyes and the, the pride of life so um it, it's in fact it's it's not even just like it's a, a a trap kind of a thing it's it's almost like that's those things are what is celebrated right like i mean turn on your television and watch advertisements i mean it's you used to get away from ads now they're back again and everything right even on your streaming services but uh unless it's advertising another show it's gonna be an ad for something that's gonna tell you Hey, you can look better. Hey, you can be better. Hey, you can make more money. Hey, you can buy something to make you feel better, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's all it, this is the status quo, right? And so uh, it's very easy for us to say, "Oh, I'm going to chase those things," and we do yeah. that. The yeah, love yeah, of the Father yeah. may not be in us when we do those things, right? And you know, it it it's, it can be so subtle. We don't even realize that it's happening. Yep, which is the real danger. So we have to really pay attention and and be very discriminating and very. Uh, able to just look at ourselves through the lens of the Bible, the lens of the word, and to try to make sure that we're not going down those, those paths that are leading us into these, into this, this, this idolatry, you know, that, that John is talking about. So, yeah. And, you know, that's why he says in 26 and 27, where he kind of left off last week, right. That I'm writing things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, right? Like those things are deception. (laughs) Someone is actively trying to get you to chase those things and be deceived about them. Um, And and you don't need me to to teach you this. You, you know, it, you have the truth. I'm just reminding you about these things. Watch out for the deceivers. So, yeah. Uh, Well, we also talked about, um, well, John has has had some some themes that are kind of recurring throughout the book. One of this is the um, he talked about the anointing, or the anointed one being Christ. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, that, we talked about the fact that Christ means that's what that means. Yep, the anointed one. Yep, um, and that the idea of of the idea of abiding in Christ or Christ abiding in you. Um, and, and the anointing in verse 27 of chapter two, the anointing that you received from him abides in you. So you've also been anointed. Yeah. And, and so you can take part in, in his anointing that right. abides now in you. So that's right. If, if the anointed one is the Christ, if, if he is the anointed and you've been anointed, right. Then what, what he's saying is that you have a piece or a part of that. And he's going to keep <laughs> right. going with that. And yep. this is not new, right. The gospel of John, again, there, there's, Another fascinating thing to do is read the Gospel of John and read First John, and then just find all the common sort of themes across them, right? Yeah. Um, and there are things that you can you can imagine John, and again, we don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit works as they're writing these things out, but I can imagine John sitting down as he's writing some of these sections and remembering to himself Jesus words, things that he said in his presence that he recorded in the gospel of John, right? This whole deal about abiding in the father and the son and this stuff, right? It's it's like, wait, that's right out of the gospel of John, right? Where Jesus was saying that and John's yeah. just, you know, re-paraphrasing it here again, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Just in case you guys didn't read that one. I'm that's right. This is the cliff note version here of this. You know, yeah, Five exactly. And get it to get the gist, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's dive into our text for today. And we're going to pick it up in chapter two, verses verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine, and then uh, 
continue on into the first few verses of first john three would you like to read today Kev? yeah i mean if we grab here through uh verse three maybe it looks like there's sort of a natural paragraph there but uh yeah. you know it says and now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming if you know that he is righteous you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So you can see there's another uh, interesting chapter break, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, that does... Like it, like Colossians. Like, yeah, I don't know it, what these guys it feels reading. like this should go here into this because, you know, he talks about being born of him and then he's going to say, yep. see what love the father has for us. It, it sometimes feels like it's not a matter of where the chapter ends, but where they feel like the new chapter should start. Right. Like this makes a good start of a chapter. See what kind of love the father has for us. <laughs> yeah. You, 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 he was just talking about that in the verse before. Right. Yep. Um, so you get this you get this statement here. Right. And we're going to see a lot in this whole section. Right. So if you're kind of if, if you've got it on the screen here, if you're watching us uh, it's, instead of listening to us uh, and you can see the rest of what's going on, or if you're looking in your in your Bibles, if you're following along that way, you know, if you look where we've read 28 through uh, verse three, if you keep reading on down through like 10, you're going to see there's a lot of um, a lot of stuff, a lot of language around fathers, sons and children. Uh, we'll see righteousness and wickedness, knowledge and deceit. All these things are going to be talked about like side by side here um uh, like like the, these couplets right fathers and sons righteous mm -hmm. and wicked knowledge and deceit right these things are all gonna be laid side by side and so it really feels like this this father and son introduction here in 28 which which connects back right this idea of abiding was back in verse 24 but yep. uh, it feels like this is the start of something new that he wants us to tell us about um and as we keep reading i think we'll see again that when we see those contrasting things that's usually uh a signal, right? That he's introducing us to some false notion that we might worship or some sort of idol, right? As we've been using right. that term. Uh, so, well, I think we're going to find him in here uh, in this section. Um, Absolutely. So one of the things that kind of jumped out at me when, when, we, when we read this again was right there in verse 28, he says, abide in him, which means to dwell, to live, to yep. always be present in him. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. It reminds me of Adam and Eve after they sinned. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit, do, right? Do you think they were shrinking from God? Yeah, in shame. It was certainly there was shame, right? Coming. They covered themselves, right? And, I mean, and they, that, we were ashamed. That, Why did you perfect, hide, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a perfect visual, right? Yeah. yeah. When Jesus comes again, we want to make sure that we have confidence in our salvation, in that we have been been pure and we've we've abide we've aboded abided <laughs> abided <maybe. Yeah. laughs> we have dwelt in christ um and and that we're we will have no shame yeah it feels a little to me like like that's a good example uh and another one that makes me think is the the different parables that jesus will tell he'll tell different ones multiple times uh mm -hmm. slightly different about you know a guy going off into a far country and he leaves things to his servants and then he comes back and there's an account and a reckoning right and right you know if you think about the talents one it's probably the most famous right and he goes in and he's like you makes an account and the guy's very confident. Hey, here's your five talents and here's five more. I mean, he's confident, right? And the same yeah. in the three talents. Here's your three. And I made three more, right? Yep. And then the, the last guy comes in, you can see a totally different like, attitude, yeah. right? Hey, I knew oh this God. and whatever. So yeah. here's what you have back. You didn't lose me, right? So <laughs> it's that same idea of this confidence yeah. and shrinking away at the coming, right? Which is, that's the story there. The, the, the master comes back uh, and yeah. what did the servants do? Well, and, and even even like the the tale of the the, the wedding feast and the, and the virgins with the oil, sure. mm -hmm. right? Yep. It five mm -hmm. that were prepared and five that weren't. And yeah. when the five that weren't prepared realized that he was coming, they're like, oh no, instant panic. Yeah. Right. Or shrinking yeah. in shame that the fact that they weren't going yeah, to be right. ready. Mm-hmm um and so it's you know a lot a lot of those same similar themes here but you know that was just one that kind of jumped out at me that we want to make sure that is and so it kind of goes straight into the in it spits in the eye of the idea that uh that is is sometimes unfortunately preached that there's this like 
all you have to do is accept Jesus in your heart one time, and then then forever you're going to be fine. And yeah, and he's really going to talk about that idea here. Ab right? he's absolutely, really going to lay into that. Um, and and you know he's going to take it from a. Uh, I mean, I don't know who's listening, but uh, you know if it's people that are from or I'm going to say religious background or tradition, right? Um, they're going to have a certain thought about how this goes. And I would say that he's taking this from the opposite sort of approach, right? He, he's doing it the opposite way. Cause what he's saying is, um, and I don't want to you know, spoil it here, but he's going to talk about this idea that this, this abiding in him is sort of the, it's not the way that you, um, you know, reach your eternal ward perhaps, but it's more the idea that when you abide in him and when you, practice it as we'll see it here in 29 right um everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him so it's it's the proof mm -hmm. that you have been born of that right uh that you've actually had this change that's occurred uh that you've that you've been born again to use the term that he uses here right uh the fact that you are practicing righteousness is the evidence right that he so he's writing to assure these people that you are in god Right. He, he's, he's trying to re reassure them that you mm -hmm. are in Christ. You And he, that's a, a theme that comes through is and we'll get it really heavy as we keep going on here uh, yep. in the rest of the, 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 the sermon, as we've called it. Um, you know, this is how we know that we know. Right. He, he really yeah. wants his his listeners, his readers to know of the full assurance that they have. Right. Like he said before, yep. I'm not writing you because I'm, I'm worried that you're falling into these things so much. I'm writing to you. So you know that you're not. Uh, and so here he says that statement, right. Which is going to really be the, the focus of this section. He is righteous. God is righteous. The son is righteous. It's a little tricky to figure out who he's talking about specifically. Who's ever coming, right. It might be, make you think, um, you know, it's the son. Um, but certainly in, in, in verse 24, he said, we abide in the father and the son, right. So, my biting right. both whatever, but we know that they, right. Uh, they are righteous. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we can be sure then that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him, right. Have been born right. of the father. Um, and so he's really going to pick up on this idea that, that our righteousness, um, and, and, you know, it, it's a little tricky because some might say, well, yeah, we're righteous because of what just Jesus has done. But there's also a sort of practicing righteousness. So it's not just sort of a state. It's it's something that we practice or do not. It's something we live in or we don't. Correct. Like, and he's gonna expand, he's gonna, he's gonna expand on that quite a bit. Yeah. But I, I think that it's it's really important to to just understand that abiding in him means that there there's it's it's a constant act activity. It's present tense. It's not a one-time check off the box kind of a deal. And so it's going to take work and effort and, um, and, and a continual drive. And Jesus himself said, listen, the, the road to destruction is broad. Wide, yeah. Many are going to find it. Yep. Uh, but the road to salvation is narrow and few will find it, which means it, it takes effort and yeah. it takes, it takes, Though if you seeking, it takes seeking and you will find those who seek and find knock and it'll be answered, but you have to be doing. And so he moves on. He says, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's just big, great, that's right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's an interesting thing, right? Because it's, he, he says, uh, and there, there's two things that are there that are somewhat interesting, I guess, right? That, just the fact that we can be called the children of God is, is, is just this great demonstration of the love that he's given to us, right? The fact that we can even be called his children is this great demonstration of love. And then it almost as though to like make you think or, or just reassure you. And it's not just a word. We are, right? It's not, it's not that he calls us that. We are that, right? Uh, yeah. And that's this great demonstration that the, that the father has given to us uh, is his, is his love for us. And again, that kind of throws you back to John as well. John three sixteen, right? Uh, like how do we know the father loved the world? Cause he gave his, what he gave his son, Only right? There, there's, there's the son thing, right? Um, th this, this, and, and it would make sense of course, that these, these metaphors would be used, right? That cause what's our best example of, of demonstrating love or, or having love it's parents to their children. Right. I mean, we, a mother's love. Right. We, we talk about those kinds of we have those phrases even in our language today. And so the fact that he uses the, the parent child relationship 
it, it makes sense that that's the picture or the metaphor that he's using to demonstrate this is love. Right? How do you know you're loved by God? Because you're his children and he's called you his children, right? It, they go hand in hand. Um, and it's, it's this, it's almost like he does say like, see what kind of love, like how, it's inexpressible. Look at, look at it, right? It's so great. Um, it, it's understatedly, um, hyperbole, right? <laughs> at, yep. at the same time, he doesn't use all these big words. He says, look at what kind of love it is, right? Um, it's, it's so great that we should be called his own children. Um, and I think that's an interesting idea. Like if we're talking about idols, Right. When we think about the idea of idols uh, and the idea of idols in um, in the pagan world at that time, I don't really think I mean, I mean there was a certain. Yeah, in fact, I know because um, the average person didn't consider themselves the children of, of a god. Right. If you if you worship Zeus, you weren't a child of Zeus. Right. Correct. There, there were people who were child of Zeus and they were called demigods, demigods. right? Like there were stories yeah. about his children, right? Like right. physical children that he had made, but everyone else didn't consider themselves his children, right? You were just a, you were a worshiper. You were an acolyte, right? But you, you were not a child of a God just because you served them. That was not the idea. And so here he says, what a great honor and gift of love it is that a God would make us his children, right? Um, and, and we are that. Uh, even though I don't have a Zeus story about him turning into a ram and impregnating my mother or anything like that, right? Like I'm really the child of God, right? Of the actual yeah. God. Um, and so that's, it's, he says, what a great expression of love that is. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and as we, as we continue on to that, that last part of that verse, he says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it, it the world did not know him, meaning God and or Jesus. Yeah. Um, and we were talking uh, probably off camera how how there's so many parallels between the Gospel of John and First John. Yeah, here's another one. <laughs> and so yeah, when I read this, I'm immediately drawn to like to John chapter 17, and you've got this amazingly beautiful prayer that Jesus is 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 praying, and in uh in the, in the middle of of 17 somewhere in, in like 14, 15, 16 in there. Uh, in like in verse 14, it says, Jesus talking here, it says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Yeah. Just as I am not of the world. Uh, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Um, and then he says, uh, as, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified. He also mentions the fact that the world's going to hate you. Yeah. Yeah. It, that, over and over me. again. John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in that prayer there, he talks about that the world doesn't know me, so it doesn't know them. Uh, earlier right. on, he will tell them, right, uh, that the world's going to hate you. Don't think yep. that well, they hated me. The servant is not greater than his master. If they don't, exactly. they don't listen to me. They're not going to listen to you either. Right. And so again, here it is again, right. The world doesn't yeah. know us because it didn't know him. John is like, I've lived this now, friends. Let yeah. me like tell you about it. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I know first, I know what he's talking about now. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so here it is. Don't, don't yeah. be surprised. And, and it's because the world doesn't recognize us because we're not the children of the world. Right. Um, and that's again, sort of an interesting idea that I would always recognize my own children right in, in a crowd i would know who my children are but other people's children like i don't i don't know you why well you're not my kid right <laughs> I, I don't i don't know who you are um and so that's the same thing he's saying here the world doesn't know us because we're not its children we're children of the father um and and even though we are that right i think you talked about this uh, as well uh, when we were chatting in, in verse two we are that now and it also doesn't we we're not fully realized, right? We and we don't know what we will fully be, right? What we will be like, what we will be has not yet appeared. Yeah. Um, so it, there's it, a, it's we're now that, me. but not all the way. Yeah. It's super interesting to me because one of the questions that I I ask in my inside in my head, you know, the things that I think sure, about, yeah. and questions that I've heard people ask, well, wh what is heaven going to be like? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And John didn't know either. Yeah. Uh, he says, you know. What we will be has not yet appeared, meaning we we're, we're not sure. I haven't seen it, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Yeah, because we shall see him as he is, meaning as he is now. Wow. Yeah. Um. And you know, I actually heard uh, a podcast 
discussing the the the, the resurrected body that we're going we're promised to have. Sure. And they tried to make the example of of the ascension of Jesus after he had uh, shown himself to the witnesses. Yeah. That it was going to be some sort of physical body, just like Jesus had okay. when he resurrected. Um, but you know, and and that oh, this was this was the resurrected Jesus in his new body. I'm like, but that, it, it doesn't make sense to me because his, his new body still had the scars and still had the holes, and you know, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to me to use that as an example of what we can expect. Yeah. And, you know, Paul will talk about, right. The very similar thing that like this physical cannot put on, you know, immortality. Right. right? And and we will be changed. We'll be changed. This, this corrupt will put on incorruption, right? Yeah. We will, the, the dead will rise and we will be changed into something else. Correct. Right. Um, and even he is not clear on what that's going to look like, except that it is right. not the flesh, right? It is, it is a different thing. Yeah. Um, and, and he uses the metaphor, uh, which I really like of sort of this idea of, of the seed, right? The seed gets planted into the ground, the physical body that we have, and it is raised up as something different. The, the mm -hmm. seed, the, the tree that comes out does not look like the seed that went in, nope. right? It is not the same thing, but it came from us. And so this physical body is the seed yeah. of what will be the new one. And and John says it this way. I don't know what that's going to look like, right? Just like Paul was like, it'll be something different, <laughs> yeah. um, but it does not know what it will be. Um, yep but it'll be like him. And I like this idea that we will see him as he is. And that's what will cause sort of the transformation, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if that's like a literal sort of thing um, or if it's him using that same sort of picture um, or, or, or metaphor. It's been talked about a lot that we're turning into Jesus and we're doing the best we can right now. But when he appears, right, then, oh, now we will know what he is like, mm -hmm. and we can take that final physical transformative step, uh, or whatever that means. Well, and then, then he kind of uh, expands on that a little, little bit in, in verse 3. He says, everyone who thus hopes in yeah. him purifies himself as he is pure. Yeah. So when we see Jesus as he is, as he is in his most pure, holy uh, embodiment uh, from the right hand of God in the throne room of heaven, we will be able to be fully realized and perfected in our new bodies, uh, which yeah. is something to hope for. Yeah, and it's, that's right. And if the one who has this hope in him, he does this act of purifying himself, right? He, yep. he goes about he 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 goes about purifying himself, and we do it because he is pure. And that kind of throws me all the way back, like uh, yeah. To the to the old law and stuff like that where there's conversations um that you know god will have with the people and saying you come out from among them in fact second corinthians gets cites several different places uh, when he's when he's telling them there to to separate themselves right come out and be set from them i'll be your god you're my people right i am holy you must be holy like these sort of ideas um yep. that were expressed in the in the physical way of the old law uh and so he says everyone who has this hope that we will be like him doesn't wait right that's sort of the idea yeah. We yep. will be like him and everyone has hope gets to work purifying themselves right now. Cause what I do know about the Christ is he is pure. I know yep. that about him now. So I'm going to do that. And now I'm going to purify myself. Um, and so well, that, and that's oh, part of the abiding in him. That's right. That's right. That's part, he's part, in yeah. Right. So it's part of the abiding in him is, is the constant purif purifying ourselves. And then he transitions into, into speaking more about the act of purification and, or, the opposite. The opposite of that, um, yeah. So in verse 4, to continue on, he says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and as he is righteous, referring to Jesus and God. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And I think we could stop right there, probably. Uh, pl plenty to unpack. Um, yeah. But this idea of making a practice out of sinning or a lifestyle of a sinful lifestyle 
if if that's if that define you know if if you fall into that category, you are practicing lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. He also says that whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Yeah, and so that first part there, right, that we we, we picked up on uh, that one who practices sinning or is doing that, he's sort of laying out the idea of in verse three we've got the purifiers, right. And verse four, we've got the ones who are not purifying themselves, right? Like those mm-hmm. two things are, are contrast against. So transgressors, right? right? The, the lawless ones, the, the ones who practice sin, they are not purifiers, right? So you're either a transgressor or you're a purifier. You, you, you're not doing both. Um, yep. And so the one who's doing that, who, who has that is, is then living in lawlessness. And, uh, you know, as we'll get, I don't want to jump too far ahead there and we already read it but there we see below then you have the opposite is practicing righteousness right Mm -hmm. and and then so practicing sin is practicing lawlessness practicing righteousness is righteousness right so he he kind of is paralleling these things just like he's going parallel telling you know fathers and sons and we'll see righteousness and wickedness and and satan and the father right we'll see them all laid out here um but you're doing one or the other right um and this thing that he says in verse five is, you know, that he appeared, right? Jesus appeared in order to take away our sins. We know that, right? You know that I'm speaking to the little children, right? You know that. And in him, there is no sin. And so the idea I think there is, if you're abiding in Jesus and he's abiding in you, well, then you can't be abiding in sin at the same time. You got to pick a house, right? You can't live in the house of sin and live in the house of Jesus at the same time because there's no sin in him. Right. And so you can't say I'm in Jesus, but I'm practicing right. sin. Well, that doesn't work. Right. Because he he came to take away sin. Uh, and so those things can't do. And so then you see it in verse six. No one who abides in him then keeps on sitting. Right. Like because right. you can't. He, he, he lives in a sinless sort of state. Right. Not a sort of state. He lives in a sinless state. He took it away. Uh, and so you can't abide in him and practice sin at the same time. Yep. You, you can't do it. Right. Um, so it, it reminds me, though. <clears throat> of of examples we have like like david king david in in, in the old sure. testament right was he a sinful man or a sinner we have lots of sure. mistakes that he made recorded for us yeah i mean then we would think that they're like just bad and some of them i'm like i've never done that he was way worse than me he was way worse than me right, right? like i've i've <laughs> never committed adultery and i've never murdered never. i've you know, never had anybody murdered subjects over it to cover it up. Right. Nope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but what made David <laughs> a man after God's own man? Of, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Is verse three. Yeah. David wanted to be pure. Yeah. Uh, you can and, read the Psalms and see that. Right. Yeah. Uh, he desperately was continually trying to purify himself. Yeah. And, and that is the difference between someone who makes mistakes and someone who practices mistakes. Yeah. Right. right. I'm trying to get better. (laughs) Uh, Exactly. And and he's not the only one, right? Abraham is no, we have a a thing called the, he's the friend of God, right? Like, you know, we think of David as a man after God's own heart and Abraham's title is a friend of God. Right. And, you can go read his things that he messed up, right? All the things he does. Yep. Is, oh, let's lie about who my wife is. Say you're my sister, right? Because I don't trust yeah. that God's going to protect us. Uh, you know, hey, God's going to be children. Oh, I'm going to do something different. Make my own plan of, you know, sleeping with a concubine, right? I mean, yeah. th- like these things are, but he was called a friend of God. Why? Because he walked by faith with him, right? When he was called yeah. to get up out of his own country. He went and he followed, right? Um, and so w- we see those things that it, it's not that there is no sin, Right. Correct. Uh, but it's, it's this practicing of lawlessness, practice of sinning, as well, opposed to practicing righteousness. Right. Which is kind of the way he, he words it in verse six. So no yeah. one who abides in him, it does not say no one who abides in him sins anymore. He says no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Right. Uh, so we're, while we are called to be purified and to be perfected through Christ, there's a, a, a clearly an understanding that you, and Paul said it: all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, it it's a tall order to try to be perfect like Christ. I'm not saying we shouldn't try, but 
there's an understanding that thankfully there's grace. Thankfully, there's forgiveness of our sins. And thankfully, there's a way for us to be justified and to be purified and to be made to be righteous as he is righteous. Um, but it takes work and it takes effort and it takes um, de determination. Yeah, and that puts us right back to the beginning of the, the sermon, right? In yep. chapter one, when he's talking about verse seven and eight, right? Uh, if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have mm -hmm. fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us, cleanses from, our us sin. from all sin. If we yep. say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not us. But if we confess our sins, he's yep. faithful and just to forgive us, right? Uh, and so we, we this is not a new thing that Paul or that John is introducing here, right? He's, he's uh, just expanding on it. But why is he telling us it again? I think he's telling us it again because of this idea um that was well there's a deception in here like we saw in those places the one who does this deceives themselves or the truth is not in him right yep. and in seven we see it little children let no one deceive you oh oh about what right what's what's the deception what's the idol yeah. what's the, false, <laughs> the false jesus right whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous right like you gotta be practicing righteous to be righteous so that you can be like him because he is righteous but whoever practices sinning is of the devil because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. And so, you know, if I'm trying to, as we sort of uh, revealed in the intro there, I, I often call this idol that, you know, that, that what, what's the false God? The false God is that God is a father of wicked children, right? That, that his children can be wicked, his children are wicked, right? And he says, no, that's the deception. If you're wicked, it's not because God has wicked children, it's because God's not your father at all. And you're really a child of the devil, right? So right. Um, don't don't deceive yourself into saying I'm a child of God just because I'm wicked. Right. That didn't change that. He goes, no, 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 that's deception, right? Um, if you make a practice of sinning, then you're of the devil because he's been a sinner from the beginning, right? And so it's really a question of you know whose child am I? Um, and you know, there's that deception and that truth, right? Do right, you're righteous, you're of him, just like he did. If you do sin, you're of the devil, just as he is from the beginning, right? And so there they are side by side. Um, and so you're one or the other. And I will often say that um, you know, children look like their parents. You know, we understand that in a very physical sense. Right. Uh, you know, you bring a new we we are constantly um bringing new babies around people that we know because we foster and uh you know we never get people saying oh they look just like you obviously but they'll ask <laughs> oh does she who does she oh right and like, oh yeah she we've seen her mom she looks a little bit like her mom oh well, where are the eyes well no that must be your dad we've never met her dad but that's not what mom's <laughs> eyes look like right uh, and and uh, people we don't even know um we the, the current child we have people we don't know are uh, are able to pick out things about her um she's she's tribal she's uh, native american and people who know will ask questions, say, oh, is her father such and such of such and such tribe? Um, and I'll go, well, yeah. I mean, as far as we know, right? Yeah. And so they're able to tell you know that, right? Because yeah. he looks like that. You know, I've just like, oh, it looks Native American, right? But um, they're they're able to pick out and tell. And yep. I'm like, it must look like her father because you're even telling me that she probably looks like her father. That's what, you know, that tribe yeah. has those characteristics um, physically in their face, right? right. And so I'm like, well, that's very fascinating. Um, so we know children look like their parents, right? In fact, it's a fun game. People like to play, oh, he's got his mother's eyes, his father's nose, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so he says, children will look like their parents. If you if you look like unrighteousness, it's because your father's the devil. <laughs> you look just like he does. If you look like righteousness, it's because your father is righteous. You're a child of God, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's how you will know. You can You can see it. You can tell. Yeah, and this idea that that um, I don't know how much you want to read into it, or I'm sure people do, but the idea that the devil has been sinning from the beginning, well, yeah, the only the, the first time we see Satan, he's that's lying, right. so, and I think that's what he's driving at there, yeah, right? That's pretty uh, much what he's driving at. Yeah, that, I don't it, think you you can read into that, you know, the you know, yeah, yeah, I don't think you're reading before that. that, you know, but yeah, um, I think that's right because in the in the in the scripture, right? Uh, when you talk about the beginning, it's always sort of the beginning of, of, of human history, right? It's the beginning of the world. It's creation, right? That's the only story. history we know. That's right. Uh, and, and John, certainly, certainly John has been referencing the beginning, right? And, and the beginning being the beginning, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And if he wants to say something else, we'll say before that, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> before the foundation of the world. Uh, so I think that's what he's making us think about. Well, what's yep. my, what's the beginning? 
Well, I think in the beginning. Oh, okay. What happened to the yeah, garden? When I first show Satan stuff, he's showing up sinning from the beginning, right? Yep. Uh, he's he's there, and and we see other places like uh, Jesus will say that, right? You have your father, yep. the devil. He was a liar from the beginning, right? Um, and so he says he's making them think of the same thing. And the end of that verse, though, right? The yeah. reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy his works, right? His he was to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, this is why Which Jesus are came, right? Sin, yeah, unrighteousness, and deception, yeah. yeah, and the accusation of all mankind. That's right. And so, don't you know? say right that yeah. uh, I'm. So, what you'd be saying if you're saying I'm a child of God, right? God is my father, but I do and practice unrighteousness. Then what he would say is, well, your brother came to destroy all those things, right? Yep. <laughs> Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So you can't, you can't claim you, you can't be in the family business if you're going to practice unrighteousness because the family business was destroying the works of the devil and his unrighteousness. Uh, yep. And so I think that's, that's really important that we, we pick up on that at the end there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so the reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So it, it made, it made me think about so many things all of a sudden, like Gen uh, Genesis three fifteen, the prophecy, the messianic first messianic prophecy sure. we have is that crush you know, your Jesus, Jesus is going to crush the head of Satan. Well, what does that mean? He's, he's going to destroy, destroy the Satan, work, have the victory, right? All of his works, and then at the end of the the whole Bible, you've got the Book of Revelation, and while it's it's confusing, very very cryptic kind of language, um, you have this 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 scene where Satan is cast out of heaven. The accuser, yeah. he's called the accuser of all mankind, right? Well, does he have the ability to continue to accuse man after Jesus has, has conquered death? And they're no longer under the law? Right. Up to that point, he had the law of God that was the, the benchmark by which all of mankind was to be judged. Yeah, he could. Keep everybody him. was guilty. Okay. Right. Yep. Everybody was guilty. Jesus comes along. He fulfills the old law, bringing in the new covenant with grace and access to God through Him as the high priest. And it's it's a beautiful picture. But but part of destroying the works of the devil. Sorry, I had a bug on my leg. <laughs> um, Part of the destroying the works of the devil is, in my mind, the way I think about it, at least, is is that Satan no longer has access to be the accuser of all mankind, because Jesus has has given us access to be pure and to be righteous and to and to take away our sins, so that we are no longer guilty. Yeah, uh, unless we are a child of the devil. That's right. right. That's right. If you're his kid, yeah. then, you can, so, you can, yeah. then you're on his team right. and he's not accusing you of anything because he right. doesn't you have know, to, you're, you're playing for the wrong team. So, yeah. all right, let's finish up here. Nine, nine uh, and 10. Yeah. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So we've got this, this, uh, we, we already kind of talked about a lot of these things, but the fact that God's seed abides in him, uh, you know, that, that you referenced, was that on, on camera or prior to it, re referencing the fact that when we, when we die. Oh no. Yeah. We talked about it here now that yeah. uh, Paul talks about the seed metaphor. <laughs> yep, yep. Seed metaphor. Right. Um, but God's seed abides in us in that we've been planted and yeah. we're, we are, uh, rooted in God. Uh, you have all these, all these, uh, um, metaphors Gross and analogies metaphors. and yeah, yeah. things like that. Uh, and we can't keep on sinning. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we know the rules and we know where we're going and we have a home looking for us. We, we are hope in verse three, everyone who thus hopes. In him, if we continue to hope in Christ and abide in Christ, we will no longer be practicing sin. We will no longer be sinning and keep on sinning. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he he makes this sort of 
clear point, right? The, the thing that I get out of this uh, very clearly is I did, you know, who are the manifest children? I think in another, in, uh, another translation, it uses that language here. It says, who are the mm -hmm. evidence who the children of God are, right? Right. But I think it's the children of God are manifest, right? By this, the children of God are manifest, probably the old King James, yep. um, it, right? It, so you can, you can see, you can know, you can tell who they are and who the devil's children are by what they practice, right? By what they do, by, by the way that they appear, they either keep on sinning because they're not of, they don't have the seed of God in them yep. or they're, they're growing into righteousness uh, in God because they have God's seed in him. Um, and by this, it is evident. It is clear who God's children are and who they are not. This is what he wants them to sort of understand. Um, and so there's a real emphasis there, right? On sort of, um, the deeds, the actions, the attitudes uh, that that they have, um, and that that reminds me a little bit. Um, a, a lot of this reminds me of, of John chapter eight, right? Because that's that whole conversation I think I, I alluded to before, um, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees there, and uh, as he's talking to them, he, he's he's saying the one who practices sin is sin slave, right? And then they say, you know. Uh, well, we're, we're the children of Abraham. Abraham's our father, right? We've never been enslaved to anyone, right? Uh, and he, Jesus' response is, you know, if you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me, a one who's told you the truth. That's not from God. This is not what okay. Abraham did, right? You're doing the works of your father. They said, we're not born of sexual, we have one father, God. He said, no, 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 right? Uh, the devil is your father, right? Yep. Um, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand on the truth, right? Yep. Uh, and so it, it really, like I say, a lot of this does calls me back to the, the gospel of John. Um, but it's that same thing there, right? That it's the deeds, the actions, the attitudes they had, right? You're seeking to kill me. Uh, you disregard my truth. Uh, yep. You're going to do these things. It's not the doctrine that they held, right? It's not that, well, we are Abraham's children we have the law right uh he says that's not what makes you a child of god is having the law right what makes you a child of god was doing the will of the father right yeah um, that's why jesus always was saying i do the will of the father my father and i are one i'm his son because i do his will right uh and you are not because you don't you do the will of your father you take after your father it's it's evident yeah. who your children are uh, i think i've used an analogy before i would tell people um at least when kelson my son started playing basketball uh you could tell he was my kid right uh, and that I had coached him and that I, whatever, because of the things that he, he would do. Right. Uh, and so he, if you ask Kelson, what is now it's probably maybe, maybe dunking, um, because you know, if you can dunk, that is your favorite thing, but, um, you know, what's your favorite part of the game of basketball is rebounding, right? Why? Cause he was my kid. Right. And I, I, I taught him, this is what you do. This is how you get on the floor. This is yeah. when he was young and first starting. Right. And so you could know, He's one of mine, right? And I taught him that, and he he likes the thing that I liked, right? Uh, the fact that he likes the game of basketball is because he's my kid, right? And he didn't just randomly pick that up. We're sports people around our house, right? And so yeah. uh, it's evident by the things that he likes and the things that he does, and the right. Uh, that's how you can know he's one of my children. And the other one is he looks like me, right? He he, and that's what. John has been saying here, right? Yep. When we look like our parents and when we do the things our parents do, right? Then we can see that we're of our father, right? And if we, yeah. you look like the devil and you do the things <laughs> he does, then you, you're his children, right? It's clear. Uh, and so it's probably a good place to wrap up there. The, the end of the verse is, is fun, right? Cause it's, that's, that's the hook for coming back next time, right? It's alluding to, and the one who does not love his brother. And then that that's whole thing right. like, going to be about that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> hook you in. Absolutely. Well, as always, we don't want to uh, to leave the podcast without uh, offering some sort of a, a way to get some help if you need it, answer your questions, Bible questions, or, or otherwise. We encourage your commentary on any of the platforms you might find us on. Um, and, of course, uh, I got the email down below if you need to reach out for us for prayer requests or anything like that. Uh, any last words, Kev? No, I think uh, just right. If you're if you're trying to think about like we sometimes do, okay, what's the idol? How do we worship the idol? What is those things? Right. It's when when we worship God as the Father, right. So there's a very there is a very Christian sort of thing that we do. We don't just worship God. We worship God as our Father, right. Right. I mean, we'll pray, Our Father who art in heaven. When we worship God as our Father, but we go on sinning, then we're worshiping an idol God, right? Because because yeah. that can't be the case. True fact. All right, everybody. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week and we will see you next time.